Hello and welcome back to another Monster Monday. In fact, welcome back to the Arcane Forge. I've been gone for a little while. Some of you may have noticed, some of you may have seen the last video that I did where I said that I was on holiday, but for those of you who have not, I've been in America for a couple of weeks and the past week I have been sort of getting ready to get back into videos and also dealing with a massive amount of jet lag. So you may not have heard from me for a little bit. Also, I apologize if the acoustics in this room are a little bit different. I'm recording in what will one day be my dining room, my office where I usually record. It's filled with everything that is gonna go into this room soon because we are renovating right now, which means it is not suitable for me to record in. Unfortunately, it has the best acoustics in the house, so there might be a tiny bit of an echo. Either way, this is Monster Monday a series where I draw a creature from D&D and I talk about its lore and its history and what it's like to fight in game. And today's monster is a suggestion by Jack Baker, who is asked to see flumps. Do you call them flumps or flumps? Either way, it's F-L-U-M-P-H for those of you who have never experienced a flump. So what is a flump? Well, for a start, they creatures called flumps because of the noise that they make when they expel air in order to stay airborne. So imagine when you're around one of these things, all you're hearing constantly is flump, 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 almost like Pokemon saying their name in that cartoon show. They are essentially floating sky jellyfish. And they're usually sort of illustrated as goofy yellow discs some gangly eye stalks and a ton of blue tentacles drooping from their underside. Drawings of flumps were the inspiration for the flying spaghetti monster painting that we've all seen. In the deep dark of the internet, if you have that in your head, you're picturing the right kind of thing when it comes to your traditional flump. I'm gonna deviate from that quite a bit, actually. I wanna see if I can make a cool flump, if that is at all possible. So I'm gonna be taking a lot more inspiration from real life jellyfish. I was been, I've been swithering here and there about maybe uh, using the design of a brain as well to incorporate into the design a little bit here, but we'll see how it goes. Either way, I'm gonna try and make a less goofy, may not be entirely able to make something that's not goofy, but a less goofy flump. Flumps were introduced to D&D in the 1981 Fiend Folio for first edition. And an interesting little fact is that they were the only lawful good creatures in that whole book. And if you ever wanted to make friends with a flying jellyfish, then you'll be glad to know that their alignment has not changed in fifth edition. Despite usually having a tiny little slit for a mouth on the top of their heads, or I suppose what looks like a mouth on the top of their heads, they can't actually speak, and they don't even use this to eat either. So maybe this is just a kind of opening with which they absorb or draw in air to then flump out underneath themselves to stay afloat. They're very psychic creatures, and so they use telepathy to speak. In fact, they're so attuned to psychic energy that they generally tend to gravitate towards the lairs of things like Mind Flayers and Aboleths, other creatures who are in some way connected to psychic energy. In these huge blooms, I suppose if it was a jellyfish, you'd call them a bloom, but a gathering, a congregation of flumps, which is known as a cloister. But they're also really, really sensitive to psychic energy they actually have a vulnerability to psychic damage. And that's because they can't really filter the psychic energy that they absorb. I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. But while I've just mentioned cloisters, these kind of congregations, it's important to mention that these things are really intelligent creatures. And their communities are just that. They are civilizations. They may not look like people, but they kind of behave like they do. Flump cloisters are strange sort of utopian communist societies where every individual contributes some kind of specialty and no one is necessarily a leader. So whether that sounds like your idea of heaven or your idea of hell, that is how they operate. If you try and ask a flump to take you to its leader, it'll be just very, very confused because everyone just contributes. It's kind of an unspoken agreement amongst all flumps that they are all contributing to the same whole, the same ends. And as this sort of weirdly functioning commune, uh, they just sort of drift towards psychic energy as a group. But as I was talking about earlier on, touched on just a little bit there, they actually eat psychic energy. Not in the same way that, let's say, uh, a mind flayer might. It doesn't have to devour your brain or remove your thoughts in order to eat. They kind of eat the breadcrumbs or the runoff 
of thoughts that you're already having. They just get sustained by being around things that think. It doesn't harm the creature that's thinking or having very strong emotions, for example. They really enjoy consuming the aura of emotions. Imagine it more like photosynthesis in that they gain energy from thought as a plant would the sun without having to actually absorb bits of sun. Does that make sense? It doesn't hurt anyone is the important part. They still maintain their lawful good status. But it does sound pretty vampiric. You do have to explain that to players and to other creatures in the D&D world because it sounds really vampiric. It sounds, you know, you think Mind Flayer, this thing's gonna harm me if I think around it. Maybe I'm gonna get dumber the longer I'm around these things, maybe. And this is why they generally tend to gravitate towards good aligned people, which they can sense, obviously, because they're, you know, tasting people's thoughts. They, can, they can't filter through thoughts, so they're automatically kind of hearing the atmosphere, the feeling of a lot of people's thoughts at all times. But if they meet with good aligned people, they can kind of explain themselves if someone sort of figures out what's going on, that they are consuming thoughts. They can explain that this shouldn't harm anyone, that this is just something that they passively do. And they inherently fear evil aligned creatures, possibly because if you told Darth Vader that you are eating his thoughts, he would probably choke you. But also because I imagine that's kind of like a poisonous thought. An evil aligned person probably has quite venomous thoughts. And these things being unable to filter will, well, I don't imagine that's a particularly tasty meal. I like to imagine flumps and their consuming of mental energy, emotions, and so on, a bit like an animal with semi-permeable skin, like a tree frog. You know, you're not ever supposed to really pick up tree frogs. Not, I mean, partially because a lot of them are quite poisonous to touch but also because their skin is so permeable because they have to absorb so much moisture through the air and through the things that they stand on that if they touch a human hand, the dirt and bacteria and oils that are all over your hands are likely to be consumed by them passively and can cause them to become extraordinarily sick. So if you get pet frogs or if you're thinking about getting pet frogs, things like that, it's usually a terrible idea to pick them up for a whole host of reasons, but at the very least, it might be because you might get, might make them sick. Flumps, I think, are exactly the same with evil or negative thoughts. They're gonna shy away from it inherently. But the way they eat is definitely very much inspired by jellyfish, who are also, in a manner of speaking, kind of filter feeders. They're predators, they eat living things, they are carnivores of tiny, tiny, tiny things, like almost microscopic fish eggs and plankton, maybe other little larval jellyfish, things like that, that would go completely unseen to us. But it's the same sort of, you know, ambiently, they're not consciously consuming, they're not um, choosing to go for a meal, they are just constantly ambiently absorbing nutrients from their periphery. They probably don't even know uh, that they have a diet of plankton. They're not actively searching for food. They just kind of absorb it. But flumps, as roughly human head size, let's say, jelly creatures, consume the emotional runoff and absent-minded surface thoughts of creatures harmlessly. They cannot help but absorb this information, which causes them to develop an incredible knowledge and wisdom during their potentially roughly 400 year lifespans and are therefore fonts of scholarly information. They can't help but hear all of your thoughts. They can't help but absorb your feelings. And so when you interact with a the flump, they gradually become more and more like you. They gradually become more and more aware and in tune with your thoughts and your knowledge. But being lawful good creatures and generally helpful things, they can be a bit of a surprise for adventurers because if you're delving into the inky black depths of a mind flayer's lair, you're likely to find flumps somewhere nearby, this horrible evil place. You've probably faced nothing but tortures and problems on your way down there. And then you find a flump and they're super chilled out people and they really just wanna help you. They have a massive amount of knowledge with which to help because everyone they interact with, they've become a little bit of part of their, their knowledge. And so they're very willing to pass this on to you if it will help you. Not least because, I mean, obviously they like to help as most people do, but I would imagine them helping makes you happy and happy feelings are likely to be maybe delicious to them, you know? You being in a good mood is probably very pleasing to them too. But this massive amount of knowledge that they have and want to share is reflected in some of their stats. They have a knowledge of arcana, they have plus four in arcana, plus four in history, and plus four in religion as well. 
I can't help but wonder, as someone who suffers with ADHD, if having a flump as a companion or an ally might be a really, really useful thing. Thankfully, I am on medication now and can therefore compose myself and complete one thought from start to finish. But prior to this, I really struggled with even interrupting my own self. I couldn't complete tasks or even thoughts. It's like being in the middle of a storm of DDoS attacks. Your brain just kind of constantly is on the edge of shutting down because there's too much information going on. But having a flump there might sort of filter through, absorb some of this information and allow perhaps a sorcerer with ADHD to focus enough to complete one task to, a, to the next. So there you go. If you fancy role-playing that kind of character, it might be useful to see if your DM would let you have like a little flump familiar or something like that. That could be pretty fun. But flumps, when they consume emotions, in fact, when they are emotional, they actually change color. And we know jellyfish can do this as well. They are bioluminescent. Jellyfish bioluminesce, if that's a term. They, they illuminate themselves with a combination of two different chemicals. Perhaps a couple more, but two major ones. The first one's called GFP, or green fluorescent protein. I'm going to maybe butcher this one. If there's a scientist in the comment section can maybe help me with the pronunciation of this one. But I think it's acorin, A-E-Q-U-O-R-I-N. But either way, through those chemicals in their bodies, jellyfish tend to live in the, the deep dark where sunlight doesn't always reach, can illuminate themselves, making them very, very enticing to prey. And flumps do the same sort of thing, only it's with their kind of emotional spectrum. Apparently they turn pink, glow pink gently. If they're amused or interested, they might turn blue if they're sad or lonely. They can glow green if they're curious with what you're telling them. And on the rare case that a flump gets angry, they might turn red. However, despite this obvious emotional color changing that flumps do, flumps actually have an ability called telepathic shroud, which renders them immune to any means, means of reading their emotions or thoughts as well as any divination magic. Which makes me wonder if a flump is kind of giving off this emotional light and they have this telepathic shroud, does that mean that we still can't tell what they're trying to say? Perhaps flumps speak in the same way that the Elcor do in Mass Effect, and as we can't even tell what they're trying to express to us with their color changing, they might have to explain what they're feeling. Maybe they all speak in a monotone, just like the Elcor, and have to tell people whether they're making a chastising rebuke, or if they're lated with happiness before they start mentioning anything. That might be quite fun to roleplay. I think that's definitely what I'll go with when my players inevitably encounter their first flump. But I mentioned earlier that jellyfish prefer the dark. Not always. You'll find jellyfish in the ocean all over the world in various different levels, but a lot of jellyfish tend to prefer the dark, where their illuminated bodies attract a lot of prey. And flumps do too possibly due to a lifetime of gravitating towards psychic energy, which tends to be prevalent around things that live in lairs, like mind flares. But in this darkness with poor visibility, jellyfish tend to leave streams, huge, enormous meshes almost, of their tentacles to entrap and catch wandering creatures. And flumps also have tentacles or tendrils, and they are also barbed. They also do a bit of damage. We know jellyfish stings are massively painful, and that's because even though you can't see them on the surface without a microscope, jellyfish tentacles are filled with loads and loads and loads of what are called nematocysts which are single-use cells. So every time they sting someone, that cell that they use to sting is completely unusable again. But they're really fascinating things. So if you imagine each one of these nematocysts like a little mason jar, and you put a jellyfish's barb, they actually have like a little sting, like a bee, inside this mason jar. I'm talking about one of the ones with the little... Um, the latches on, you know, the airtight ones, maybe that's not a mason jar, but you know, an airtight uh, jar with a metal latch, you know, the one of those ones that gets the kind of suction and makes a vacuum. And inside is a giant bee sting that's all coiled up really, really tight in a bunch of springs. And as soon as something brushes against the jellyfish's tentacle, they unknowingly unleash this latch on the nematocyst, opening the lid of this mason jar, let's say, and out fires, due to this pressure, the jellyfish's barb, which injects the poor creature with venom. And so the more you struggle while in absolute agony, with all this painful venom coursing through you, the more wrapped up you get in tentacles, the more of these nematocysts go off, 
and have a chance to reach you, the more pain you'll be in. But flumps have a similar ability. They have an attack called tendrils. So the melee attack has a five foot reach. And if it hits you, it deals 1d4 plus 2 piercing damage, not a big deal. But it also does a further 1d4 acid damage. And like a jellyfish's sting, this just persists. This pain just keeps going on and on and on. So at the end of each of your turns, if you're stung by a flump, you need to make a d10 constitution saving throw, taking a further 1d4 acid damage every time you fail. And that just keeps going on. Apparently you can cast a lesser restoration spell on the person who is burning from a flump sting to end this condition immediately. I suppose if, you're, if you've watched that Friends episode, you might want to pee on someone who has been stung by a flump. For those of you unfamiliar, it's fabled that if you were to urinate on someone who's been stung by a jellyfish, then that would alleviate the pain of a sting because this venom is very alkaline and urine is supposed to be quite acidic. And if you neutralize that chemical, then it's likely to stop hurting. In the same way that, you know, um, nettles here in the UK. I don't know if you get those in the States. You, you probably do, right? But, you know, stinging nettles are absolutely everywhere. Bushes of nettles. I remember as a kid running through nettles, falling over in nettles about once a week and getting tons of little stings all over you. That's an alkaline chemical that's being injected into you through little fibrous hair-like needles on the leaves of this plant, which is very prevalent. And similarly, if you neutralize the chemical in that, if you neutralize this alkaline, then you'll stop feeling the pain. And apparently vinegar, i.e. something that's very sharp and acidic, and hot water are the best combination to remove the pain from a jellyfish sting. But if you wanted to pee on another adventurer while they're in agony, just for fun, I mean, that is a good opportunity to do it. Although the rest of your group might question your decisions. The other attack that a flump has is stench spray, which you can use once a day. And that reads as follows. Each creature in a 15 foot cone originating from the flump must succeed on a difficulty 10 dexterity saving throw or be coated in a foul smelling liquid. A coated creature exudes a horrible stench for 1d4 hours. The coated creature is poisoned as long as the stench lasts and other creatures are poisoned while within five feet of the coated creature. A creature can remove the stench on itself by using a short rest to bathe in water, alcohol, or vinegar, which is absolutely revolting. So don't tick off a flump. They may not kill you, but they might make you massively antisocial and poisoned. And that kind of reminds me of, you know, either with the tentacles of a flump, maybe it was inspired a bit by um, squids ejecting ink into people's faces to get away, or it could be like the hagfish, which when stressed or provoked, releases huge amounts of this sticky, stinking mucus into the water. I go into that quite a lot more with the Aboleth video that I did, because Aboleths also do something like this. But that did get me thinking if this hagfish connection, maybe Aboleths and flumps as two hagfishy psychic creatures are in some way connected. Unlike a jellyfishes though, flumps can actually walk on their tentacles. They tend to fly 30 feet by doing their little flump, 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 you know, expelling air thing. But if they need to, they can actually walk around on their tentacles. They only move five feet per round, but it might be useful for getting through uh, tight crevices and low ceilings and so on, somewhere where there's not room for air maybe. It's kind of humorous to think about a little jellyfish wandering around on its tentacles. And humor is kind of the word of the day for flumps. They've always been regarded as a bit of a joke, which looking at the creature in the monster manual, yeah, I see it. And nowhere is this more prevalent than in their prone deficiency, an actual trait of this creature, which is that if a flump is knock prone, you need to roll a dice. On an odd result, the flump lands upside down and is incapacitated. At the end of each of its turns, a flump can make a dexterity saving throw to hopefully try and right itself, ending their incapacitated condition. So although they can stench spray you and it can be absolutely awful, if you are in a fight with flumps, however you've managed to provoke flumps, all you need to do is grab them by the head and turn them upside down and then they are pretty much stuck until the end of the fight. They are incapacitated. You can just coup de gras there or just for your own amusement, just leave them upside down. Although that is a bit cruel, it's a big problem for actual jellyfish. Jellyfish can become inverted and end up looking like, you know, when an umbrella gets sort of blown inside out in the wind. And there are creatures called upside down jellyfish, which are perfectly happy in a state that looks a bit like this. 
they are the right way up to them though but normal jellyfish which do the traditional bulb on the top tentacles flowing down into the water kind of thing if they become inverted it can be hugely problematic for them this tends to happen when water has an incorrect salt content, if the water is sort of impure, if it's dirty, if it hasn't been cleaned recently, or if they go into what's called temperature shock, if they are put in too warm a temperature. They like to be very cold. As I say, they like to be in the dark where the sun usually doesn't reach, which means they like quite cold water. But if any of these conditions are met, primarily really the temperature shock thing, their gelatinous bodies, which are you know largely water, are held together with strong proteins, much like a spider's web is extraordinarily tough, but a liquid is held together by strangely tough proteins. That's the same case with a jellyfish's body, but if this rapid temperature change affects them, they might invert because these proteins stretch and warp and expand and contract at really unpredictable ways for them. They get no control over their body, so they might invert. and will find it very hard to write themselves until possibly specific conditions are met, like lowering their temperature and making sure they're in the right kind of water that's clean. But while inverted, a jellyfish may very well starve to death because, you know, obviously its tentacles aren't sort of hanging down, it's in a lot of distress, it's very stressed out, it may just struggle to survive, and that is unfortunately something that kills a lot of jellyfish. But anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. I really loved drawing a flump. It's a favourite creature of mine that I've not ever used in any of my campaigns, but I've encountered as a player quite a lot, and they are really, really fun. And I think, although I did try my best to make them look slightly less goofy, slightly more space age, they are still wonderfully goofy creatures that should be in as many encounters as possible, as many campaigns as possible, I mean. But yeah. So I'm back, I should be making as many videos as I can for you guys. That starts with Monster Mondays. I have a huge list of your monsters that you suggested for me to draw. But if you want to add to that list, keep me drawing Monster Mondays for as long as I conceivably can. Please make sure to leave in the comment section below what monster you'd like me to draw. If you want to help the channel to grow, if you want to say thank you for this content and all of that good stuff, please make sure to leave a little thumbs up, a little like below there. Maybe favorite this video and share it with someone. With your help, if every person here shared with one person who likes D&D, then this channel would absolutely explode and that would be really, really amazing. So thank you so much for your support. If you want to support me in a more personal way and you'd like maybe some rewards, including prints of all of the Monster Mondays that I do each month, if you want to have more of a chat, or you want to receive some homemade homebrew content from me every single month, then please make sure to head over to my Patreon page where backers get all sorts of stuff, including physical or digital prints of my Monster Mondays. So thank you very much for your support and your kindness. Until next time, guys, always trust a flump and happy monster hunting.